Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. We did have a show over the weekend talking about the Japanese naval landing units, which was amazing. But now we're kind of talking more about the Allied side of things this rest week, rest of the week. So we've got nothing to our night Wednesday. Gavin Mortimer's talking about David Sterling, the founder of the SAS. We've got shows about Polish commandos. And uh, today we are looking at the Devil's Brigade or the First Special Service Force or the, the other nicknames they acquired. And I just confess to my guest, Brett Werner, that my research, I did a bit more research than this, but I did watch the 1968 Devil's Brigade movie last week. I was doing other stuff. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't taking notes, but I thought it'll just get me in the spirit of things. So a unit that has both an American and Canadian um, ancestry, but also inspired by what was happening in Britain as well. So this, I must stress, is part one of uh, of a series of two shows. Part two will get to the really exciting uh, combat in Italy, which is again depicted in that movie that I just mentioned, and I won't mention it again. That's it. No more mentioning of it. But today we're going to talk about the formation of the unit, how it was set up, what it was intended to do, the, some of the figures behind it, and how they went about uh, going into combat. So without further ado, I will bring in my guest, Brett Werner. So uh, good afternoon. You're a teacher and you're an author. So welcome to the show, Brett. Now, thank you so much. I really, uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. So before we get into the presentation, you got when did your interest, where did your interest in the first special service force start? Uh, I kind of stumbled upon it uh, the way, you know, I guess anyone stumbles upon something unique like this. I was, you know, in high school, very interested in, in Second World War history. Uh, and I was getting involved in living history, which I'll, I'll talk about a little at the end where I've gotten to meet the veterans. Um but I was getting involved in living history uh, and I was trying to find a unit and I, I wanted to do something British. Uh, and, 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 but I had a lot of the American gear and I actually had a, a park, but had no idea what, what, you know, who used these things uh, like a, a, third, a second pattern mountain park. And I, um, I ended up meeting some people that had started this group, the first special service force. I had never heard of it, but they said, well, if you're interested in doing British stuff, this is your chance that you could be a Canadian, you know, and you could, you, you, and I, and I found it, but they wore all American stuff. And I, I, what? So I started to, to dive in research and, 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 and just came mesmer. I was just captivated by this group. I, I thought the, the history of this unit is amazing. And, and this is before a lot of the books had come out. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a real kind of blow up, you know, later there were the original books, um, the devil's brigade and Burr hands, uh, you know, a unit, official unit history. So I got copies of those and I started reading and, and, you know, it, it, I just, nope, it, it, except for the devil's brigade, which you'd mentioned there, which had by this time in the, in the early nineties had faded away from, you know, not many people uh, of my generation had seen it. And, and so I just became interested in, in doing it and, and kind of researching this unit and doing it right. And it, it led to, you know, me kind of building up a, a living history group around it and and then starting to, you know, realize the Osprey had some gaps in, in their books. I, I said, you know, I mean, just on the force, they've been mentioned, but they're not, they're not there. So I, I you know, I, I kind of pushed, you know, I, I, I wrote a, a proposal and they said, yeah, we'd love a book on the first person service force. And by this point, I'd, I'd been going to veterans reunions and and, and talking to the vets and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, that, that's how I got interested. Well, great. And what we will learn about is it has kind of a, a interesting conception and then it has lots of influence beyond its existence as well. Because, you know, when we talk about the you know, Alamo Scouts or the Parachute Regiment, some of these units that were formed in World War II, they inspire units that come later, things that kind of grew out of this concept were adopted Absolutely. by various other nations because World War II is the experimentation era in terms of special units, isn't it? So, I mean, it's, it's where lots, of, lots started, some survived, some drifted away, some morphed into something that, that wasn't their original intention. But, you know, it was the, it was the era of let's take the war to the enemy in a different way. So, as usual, folks, Brett has come um, with, a, with a PowerPoint, which he'll be in charge of. I can just sit back and listen. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Brett. If you've got questions, if they're kind of about the slides, things as we're going along, ask them as we're going along. If they're kind of broader questions about the, the legacy of perhaps of the force, then we can perhaps do those at the end. But, uh, of course, feel free to share your comments. And uh, if you're new to World War II TV, hit that subscribe button. And, of course, the link to Brett's books are in the description below. And um, I urge you to go out there and get the Osprey one and we'll advertise the other one. The second book when we do the show in Italy, so we'll do one at a time. But over to you, Brett. Let's let's sit and learn. Right. 
Okay, so I guess to really kind of, and, and we talked about this a little before the show started, to understand the First Special Service Force, it, it, it goes before the Canadian and American uh, involvement was even, I mean, the United States wasn't even at war yet. I mean, this goes back to, to the Blitz and, 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 and the battle for France and, and, um, and, and, and the Battle of Britain, where, where you know, Churchill's kind of policy became, you know, go on the offensive. Uh, and uh, this idea, and, and, you know, I equate this a lot to the, the, the Great War mentality of, you know, raid, <laughs> raid uh, for, for morale, raid for intelligence, uh, tie up, you know, greater greater numbers of troops. So it all, it all ties back to this. So to really understand the origins of the force, you have to, you have to kind of understand where, where Churchill uh, was at this point. Um, and, and, and as they're standing up the commandos and things in, in Great Britain and starting to, to look at, at, at uh, smaller unit uh, forces that can be uh, inserted into places like Norway, uh, France, the coastline of France, uh, and, and to do some damage. Uh, th- this is this is a big, you know, this, this is the big motive behind it. And as, and as they're developing these concepts, uh, they're bringing in into British intelligence guys like like Dr. Jeffrey Pike, who had this vision for. And he's a very eccentric person, and, and no matter what account you read, uh, very few people got on with him. Well, uh, but but he had this vision of okay, let's have a vehicle, <laughs> uh, a snow vehicle that can that can you know uh, be inserted by plane uh, somehow. Uh, and uh, or maybe landing craft, but planes seem to be the and and, and we can they can go through Norway and attack these hydroelectric plants, uh, and then and then it became kind of a focus on on, on a couple of these plants that were, were potentially making heavy water for for a potential German nuclear program. So there was a real threat in Norway, uh, and, and and at this point the Norwegian government is in exile in London. And uh, so he's working on on this program. And of course, he gets the ear of Churchill, who this is exactly where Churchill's head is with this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, let, let's attack them. Uh, and, and this is when when, uh, you know, Lord Mountbatten, chief of combined operations, gets a hold of this. And, and they basically named this thing. You know, they said they're going to be like a snowplow and they're going to go through Norway and, you know, hit all these hydroelectric dams and, and uh, uh, generating facilities and. So this is where the, the plow project and, and the Jupiter deception are born. You know, Jupiter was going to be kind of the, the concept behind Jupiter was, was going to be, a, you know, a full on invasion of Norway and, and, and plow was going to be the smaller unit kind of pushing through uh, and hitting these targets and that essentially acting as a large guerrilla force that could be broken up. The, the problem with all of this is there is no vehicle yet. Uh, the, the, no one's trained in this kind of stuff. So, so it's all in the idea phases starting, you know, in 1940. Come, come December 7th, 1941, you have, uh, you know, the, American, the Americans are in. And, and, of course, Churchill immediately, you know, he had been trying to get American support, you know, much, you know, much earlier than this and, and, and was to some degree. But but now it was a, a more formal alliance, and, and and he could you know more freely ask the Americans and and, and look at Americans. And say, okay, we, you've got the industrial might. Maybe you guys could develop this vehicle. And this this is where the plow the plow project was kind of pitched to the American Joint Chiefs and, and then to the you know, President uh, Roosevelt. Uh, and 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 early on, the Americans kind of bought into this, and and these are kind of the key people again and i was saying to you I, I don't normally uh start you know when i when i do things like this i typically like, like bottom up history you know looking at the guys and we'll get to that but, but to understand the force you really have to go top down uh and because it, it was developed at this level so the the the, the plow plans come to uh to, to general george c marshall who's chief of staff uh and, and they're 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 listening. Okay, we might be able to develop, you know, a vehicle, uh, and, and and it goes to Studebaker. You know, they're able to get get Studebaker kind of working on this, and they said, well, we might have an engine that that'll work for this. And, and there were some prototypes 
that some of these companies had been messing with. But so so they start a Studebaker company starts working on um, making a, a a snow vehicle because the whole this whole operation was supposed to center around this vehicle whatever you know it was supposed to be, you know and and, and 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 going back to jeffrey pike he had said it should be treaded and it should be lightly armored and and be able to you know uh carry uh nine skiers behind it with some supply but it has to come out of an airplane so th- th- this is what they had to work with and so you know the americans start start looking at this in in, in you know january of, of 42 uh february 42 they start you know going going on in this um and then Eisenhower and, and basically Major General Dwight Eisenhower, who's the assistant chief of staff at this point, and this you know when he when he changes roles, that's kind of an important uh, moment as well. But at this point, he's assistant uh, chief of staff, and 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 he basically you know he, they go over to they go over to London uh, to talk to Mountbatten about this project, the Plow Project, and and. Now it's come to the attention of the U.S. Well, maybe maybe we should have a, a joint force of troops uh, that are trained to use these new snow vehicles that are going to be you know dropped into Norway. Uh, would the Americans be interested in, in providing troops to this? And, and Eisenhower uh, agreed. Uh, so it was supposed to be originally, interestingly enough, a British American. Norwegians, because they wanted Norwegians that could, you know, work with the locals, and then Canadians. So it was supposed to be kind of a, a, a four-nation blending of forces, at least in theory. And it's just so worth mentioning, Brett, because we we forget now, people watching this, why is there such an obsession with Norway at this part of the war? Because Norway is sort of seen as a secondary theater now, but there was a belief, and there are some historians Dr. Alexander Clark is one of them who who think is Norway is the big theater that never kind of happened. It, 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 in the end, there was, of course, things that were happening there. There was the German heavy water industry to power their nuclear program. There was resistance activity and there were these battles in 1940. But there was a belief that Norway was going to become a really, really important theater. So that's why, folks, if you're wondering why people of Eisenhower and, and um, Marshall's um, prominence are discussing Norway when we now know not much really happened in Norway in '42. This is where it all comes from. This was a, this was when Norway was considered to be a, a really big event that kind of never happened. I'm, I'm glad you said so. It, 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 so it, you got to remember too that this is the point where the Russians are, are kind of well, where's our other front and and and, yeah. and how are we going to get supplies? So that's another you know that's another reason North Sea and all of that that Norway. Was really kind of looked at as is is the area of focus at this point. Now, now we'll see as we talk today that, that this this will shift dramatically in, in just a few months' time. But uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct. No, I mean, uh, you know, there was Russian considerations at this point, uh, and and so and, and again, the problem with Norway is that it's covered by snow, you know, nine months of the year, and and uh, so that that was the 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 push for a vehicle that could handle yeah. this. So yeah, it continues. So it, it goes to, you know, Eisenhower who, who, you know, meets and, and, and they're talking about this, uh, back in the U S uh, um, you know, Mountbatten finally, you know, he comes over with Pike. They want to talk about the prototypes of this vehicle. Uh, and, and things are starting in, 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 in the winter of 42. Uh, and I'm talking like January, February, March of forty two are really starting to, to 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 gear up. This is this is going to happen as long as this vehicle gets out because their their, their target is the winner of uh you know they're looking at forty three December forty three you know January forty four to, to get an operation uh moving in Norway. So uh there's a lot happening. There's a lot of meetings. The Americans are starting to meet with the Canadian government now, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and what I one of the, the more interesting parts of this story is when uh, so we have you know so there's Eisenhower in the center there, uh, you've got General Marshall, Chief of Staff on the left, and then we have this uh, Staff Lieutenant Colonel on the right. Now this photo is taken after, uh, but but uh, the Staff Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Robert T. Frederick, 
who is the uh, at this point works for the operations division of the general staff. So his boss is Eisenhower, a West Point grad, had been uh, coastal artillery trained. Uh, that was kind of his his forte before he went to staff. So we have this, and basically uh, Eisenhower says to Frederick, hey, "Could you do a feasible feasibility study on this thing? Uh, you know, is this is this potentially uh, something that we could we could do?" And uh, he does, Frederick does, and basically comes back to Ike and says, um, this isn't going to work, <laughs> and, and gives a list of reasons why the plow project was doomed to failure. And basically, you know, he, he talks about, the, you know, we have no exit, the biggest one, we have, we have no exit plan. We drop in a thousand Paris skiers with vehicles. Where are they going to go? Uh, you know, what happens if there's you know, too much cloud cover and we can't get resupplied. Basically, he said it's a suicide mission. Um, he said, we don't have the planes right now that can do it. We, we don't even have a vehicle that is functional. Um, so he, he gives a, a myriad of reasons why this isn't going to work. Uh, and, and basically, Eisenhower says, OK, great. We're, st we're still going forward. You know, the, the promises have made have been made at the higher level. Uh, this is still happening. OK, uh, so what 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 then happens is 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 one of the big ironies of the war uh, or not ironies, but one of the, so the, the, the next set of who's going to command this plow force and and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson is picked and, uh, you know, he meets with Pike, uh, Jeffrey Pike, the scientist. And within a few hours said, I, I can't work with this guy. Um, and uh, Mountbatten then turned to I, you know, basically said to Eisenhower, "How about that, Lieutenant Colonel Frederick?" Uh, and and Eisenhower basically, you know, then went to Frederick and said, "Look, you know, you know the most about this. You've been on 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 the uh, uh, on the staff working on this. You did the feasibility study. It's yours now." <laughs> so so Frederick, you know, the guy that basically said this shouldn't happen is the guy that get command of the of the plow force uh, which is really interesting brett because if we just compare to some of the british units that are being founded at the same time a lot of the people were kind of adventurers they were the people who had seen combat they traveled the right. world they had been part of guerrilla for you right. think of like wingate and uh, in the out in the far east or um david sterling who we're talking about on wednesday most people will say they'll come up with exceptions now and say Woody's got it wrong again. But most special forces units seem to come from that kind of charismatic, out there in the field kind of person. Frederick is a staff officer. It, it's most of these units ended up getting someone like Frederick on board to help with the planning. But it's right. interesting that he ended up being the guy who commanded it because he doesn't really fit the bill of your well, typical. Not 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 at first not at first exactly yeah but he but he does fit the bill when when they get operational it, it's kind of amazing. it's almost like uh there was this this you know adventure special forces guy waiting to jump out it's you know when you, when you, but you have to understand the US army in the, in the 20s and 30s it was scaled back these career army officers uh that went to West Point like Frederick did they all kind of knew each other or knew of each other uh and, and I think you know in in in, in I think that's kind of where Eisenhower saw in him that you know, this is going to be the guy that's going to lead it, even though he doesn't think it can work. He's the guy that can make it work. Uh, and, and, and I think that's why Frederick was so kind of, you know, took, took, took the challenge essentially said, okay. And, and, and did it in a way that it was the basis of the U S and in some ways the Canadian special forces. I mean, he, yeah. he sets that mold with what he is going to develop next. Um, so yeah, but I, I see your point. He, he his background was not of you know uh, uh, of, of the adventure type guy out there fighting in, in the twenties and thirties, and 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 so it, it, he is yeah, he's a staff officer. <laughs> he was a staff officer. Cool. Um, and, and then when we look at so some of the Canadian players, so now the Canadians are becoming. Uh, more committed to this project, and and and, and during the, the the winter and spring of '43, um, you see, uh, you know, the, the the English basically, the British at this base at this point basically said, okay, well, it's not, you know, we're kind of working on our own things now. You guys have this, you know, we're going to kind of pull back. So then the force 
you know, we're, we're not going to have British soldiers in it. We're going to have, you know, the Commonwealth will be represented by the Canadians. We'll still have Norwegians and we'll have, you know, Americans. So, so now the U S delegation, you know, Frederick is going up to talk to the Canadian government with Marshall and, and, and uh, Canadian prime minister Mackenzie King, of course, is going to have to sign off on this. Uh, and you have him in the center you have uh, Lieutenant General uh, McNaughton, uh, who is the overseas commander of ca the Canadian forces in Great Britain. You know, he's been briefed by Mountbatten on this. Those that this project coming um, signs off on it. Essentially, he says, OK, we'll be you know, we'll be a part of this uh, back in Canada. You, they start to. So as as Frederick is starting to develop basically a, a an outline of what this group will look like and how it will be integrated. Uh, the idea would be that it would, the, the, the force would be totally integrated. It wouldn't be one regiment of Canadians, one regiment of Americans, and one regiment of Norwegians, that it would be an integrated force. Uh, it, the, then we'll get, to, there would need to be a Canadian, uh, the idea was that there would be a Canadian executive officer. Right. Uh, and it eventually end up being uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Williamson, and, and I'll get to him in a moment. He's not the first. Uh, but he will end up being the Canadian contingents commander in, 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 in a way. And I'll explain kind of how that was. It was more of a paper commander than, than legit than, than, than a commander commander. Um, he will also command second regiment and, and we'll talk more about him when we get to defense it as well. Uh, so these are the kind of Canadian key players uh, that, that, that are starting to get involved in the project. And this is just, you know, you know, this is Frederick's original table of organization. You can see the date, July of 40, July 1st of 42. Uh, and basically this is where he breaks down how the first special service force will be integrated, you know, and, 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 and how it will be kind of set up. And they, they, for the most part, uh, stick with this, this formula that the force will be completely integrated, that it will, have a certain, you know, three regiments, uh, each, each regiment. And I think the next slide might have, yeah, there's kind of, this is the later breakdown, but there'll be three regiments. Uh, each regiment will have two battalions. Um, the battalions will have three companies. Uh, and, and with each, and within each company, there will be three platoons. And within, within each platoon, you'll have uh, two sections. So they, they, they already you're starting to see kind of, you know, this is kind of a, um, uh, a mixing of, of, of Canadian British uh, organization names like section. We don't use that in the, in the American army uh, to, to uh, and in a blending with, with, with American kind of concepts as well. Um, and, and the section the, the, was supposed to be based, you know, a nine man section originally, it'll, it'll move up to 12 based around what, what the weasel could, could, uh, you know, the, the snow vehicle that's in development could, could handle. So really, you know, get, getting, you know, well, this slide, uh, really getting on to, to, to the development of, of the organization, July of, of 40 two is is really kind of the, the critical month uh it's at this point that you know all this developing's happened there's been meetings in washington london uh in, in ottawa uh by this point the project is moving forward and some things on, on the outside are happening uh, you know eisenhower is now overseas is is, is uh the allied commander uh and, and focusing on on that uh the Norwegian government in, in right after the, this document came out, basically backed out of the project and said, look, we don't think plow is a good idea any longer. Uh, we don't support it. We feel that the German repercussion on, on the Norwegians at home would be, would be bad. They, that they would, that they would do some, some, some terrible things. They said that we also don't want our infrastructure destroyed uh, like these, these hydroelectric plants. Um, so they start to, and we just basically back out, but they do say that they'll still offer ski instructors, which will be utilized in training. So July, the Canadians make their final commitment to the force. Um, and, and basically Frederick, uh, at this point, it, it, he's, his 
picked up an, uh, an executive officer, McQueen, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel McQueen of the Canadian uh, Army, who will be the de facto Canadian commander and uh, uh, the XO. So uh, things are moving in the right direction. This, this slide here just shows what I wanted to talk about next, the, the kind of formation on the Canadian side of things. So while this is going on, uh, in, in Canada, there has been um, some political struggle over the creation of, of what will later become the first Canadian parachute battalion, uh, one can para. Uh, there's, there's people that want it, but they, they don't have a school in Canada, so they're, they're talking about you know training them at Benning for a while. Uh, you've got... Uh, people that aren't really sure well, what's the purpose of a Canadian parachute battalion. Well, as the plow project was proceeding, they decided, well, we, we need to recruit parachutists for plow for the plow project for these, you know, because the Americans were originally looking for about 500 enlisted guys. That number is going to go up to 600 Canadian enlisted guys and, and, and 40 some officers. So what they do is, under the disguise of creating the first Canadian parachute battalion, uh, they're really, and a lot of people don't, don't know this, but they're really recruiting for the plow force first. That was the first priority. Get the guys that are going to go airborne qualified for the plow force. Uh, and then we'll create one camp power. And that's, and, and then we can tell everybody that's what we were recruiting for. So the interesting thing is, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is one can para was actually born out of the plow force, which will get the name two can para on, 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 you know, officially in Canadian books. So it, what, what so, and this is where things are complex. So they're, they start recruiting for the Canadian parachute battalions in, in, in Canada. It's also at this time that Frederick had recommended, he said, you know what, I think the Canadian force should, the forces should just resign from the Canadian army and, and, and join the U.S. army so that logistically everything is, is you know, uh, under our administration. And the Canadian government, you know, probably to their credit in many ways, absolutely refused. They said, no, these are still Canadian soldiers. It is going to create a real issue with pay. Because the American soldier was paid uh, almost forty percent more than the, the Canadian soldier, and that that never gets resolved. Um, so there's going to be pay discrepancies. It always for... comes down to money, Brett. But just yeah, to right. let you have a sip of water there, the, the, the fact that when we've talked about on this channel before, this 1942-43 era is the era of people being recruited for a special force, and by the time they join it, it's changed its name, its commanding officers changed, and its purpose has been changed. This is exactly what's happening in Britain and around the world with special forces. Uh, by the time you get to 44, everything's kind of in its place then. Everyone knows, well, this lot of paratroopers, this lot uh, for amphibious landings, this lot of for doing whatever it is. But in 42, 43, yeah. you survive if you're adaptable. Yes. And we're going to get into that. So, so... They, they finally agree that they'll have a, a uh, you know, the, they're going to remain Canadian, but they're going to be integrated. They're going to be, and this is where we get into the formation, right? So they're going to be supplied by the U.S. Army. They're going to, you know, they're going to be based based by the U.S. Army. Um, so all the uniforms, the equipment, everything's going to be U.S. Uh, by this point, the prototype of the weasel has come out, but they, they haven't gotten any yet. Uh, and, and, and basically, Frederick says, okay, let's be ready to roll by by." August 1st. I want the Canadian forces in the U.S. And it also in July, Frederick sent his, his staff out and, and they found the perfect location, Fort William Henry, just outside of Helena, Montana. And it is, you know, it's a, it was a small post, but it was the perfect spot for this kind of training because they had mountains. They, they had uh, the winter temperatures and snow. Uh, you know, in, in some areas, it, it could go below, you know, 30, 40 below. Uh, it, it, so the, the fort was picked. Uh, Canadian forces start to arrive uh, after August 3rd. Uh, and, and, and now now it's kind of game on. Right. Uh, it, 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 at this point. So, so what you have is an organization of of of. Canadian Americans, they're going to be integrated once they get there. 
uh, that you have uh, a Canadian XO, an American officer. You know, the Plow Project is still the main focus, but that's going to change it very soon. Uh, and 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 now we have to look at well, what were they going to do to train these guys? And and I do want to talk about some of the so so who were the guys that joined this group, right? And this is another kind of side element to this. Our, our note, you know, of course, I'll, I'll bring up the Devil's Brigade. Uh, you know, the Devil's Brigade movie made it look like that some of the Americans were, you know, throw them out of the stockades. Let's you know, dirty dozen. Let's get rid of these guys. And you know, there is there is there is. Not much credibility to that, other than maybe a post commander here that may have thought, "Well, I can get rid of this guy and send him that way." But most volunteered. Uh, you know, the the call uh, uh, the call went out for for you know guys that were you know Frederick was looking for guys that weren't married, that were older, between twenty one and thirty five, uh, that had experience either as lumberjacks or woodsmen or you know forest service or some some kind of rug that was skiers, you know, something that that was outdoors uh, oriented. And and so th this is what it kind of drew on. And, and some of the you know, the officers that, that kind of first came in were, were were guys that had just graduated from from Benning. So he, he grabbed some of the early parachuted officers uh, and, and and other places. The Canadians did likewise. Uh, for the most part, the, the you know the Canadian soldier had been in longer. Uh, some uh, had come from 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 you know the, from, from the UK. Uh, some had, you know, the, the, some had, had even seen combat, um, uh, a handful. So you, you, and, and a lot of the Canadian guys were just, you know, they'd been sitting around, you know, England for, for a few years and just thought, well, I'm bored. I need a change. You know, this, is, this isn't going. So they thought they saw this as an opportunity to get into the fight quicker. I think, I think where that's where some of this myth about them being, um, you know, out of prison and stuff is because, you know, you know, my my own great uncle was involved sitting in England for a long time before D-Day happened. And I think if you've got those those soldiers who are who are so wanting to get in action that they're almost causing a morale problem amongst the other men because they just always want they're, they're the kind of people you kind of push forward for these kind of voluntary voluntary right. things, not to get rid of them, but just to to a harness their enthusiasm and b kind of not piss off the other blokes who are kind of happy going through training. So I think. Because some people have a more enthusiasm for it, maybe they would be seen as being different, and then different being seen as an outcast. But it, from what I've read, they are they are coming as you as you know from a variety of backgrounds. But yeah, right. not not criminals, and and um, but definitely interesting people. I I, I completely agree. There there you know there there is definitely a spirit to these guys that that you might not find elsewhere. And um, so when they get there, uh. Now we can talk about what, you know, let's talk the, the training, you know, what was, what, what, what did they have to do? And, and this is where, you know, training is broken down into um, basically like four week, originally broken down these four week kind of sections. So it's going to start in August, August, September, and then they have an October, November, and then it was kind of a December, January training syllabus. The idea was that they could be ready to, to go into combat by January of 44. And, and it's going to be an intense training program. And the first thing that they have to tackle is these guys are supposed to be airborne qualified, right? They're, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be paratroopers. So Frederick, and this is where Frederick starts to shine as a, a, you know, kind of the, the founding father of American special forces. He basically says, he looks at the Benning four week jump program and says, Okay, let's convince this four-week program in the 10-day. They don't need this. They don't need this. They don't need this. It's also important to realize at this point that when, when they formed, you know, you had the, the three combat regiments of the 1st Special Service Force, they also had a service battalion. And, and I think this is kind of the genius behind it. The service battalion of the 1st Special Service Force was all American. These were not combat soldiers. This, these are the guys that did everything else. Guard duty, the cooks, the maintenance guys, you know, all the legworks are all the stuff to kind of support that combat element so that that combat element, you know, when they're on post at Fort William Henry Harrison, they don't have to worry about pulling guard duty or, or cook details or mundane stuff that needs to be done by professionals, but, but they could focus just on combat. So by having that group, uh, 
you could you could do like para training and condense it a bit. For example, in in the service battalion, you had you had parachute riggers from Benning, and these guys did all the, the you know the parachute. Uh, you know, would, would pack the shoots and all that. Force guys never learned how to do that. They didn't need to. They had riggers, uh, and 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 that's kind of where Frederick could start to jump down. He said, "Well, we don't have towers built at Fort William Henry Harrison. You know, uh, we'll, we'll, they don't need. Them. We'll just we'll just jump." And uh, what he did was he condensed the program to ten days, roughly. Um, they were going to do two jumps. He said, "If they can do two, they can do five. Five was the standard U.S. Army jump. They can do two. Uh, and, and really, the parachute training went first for a couple of reasons. They also looked at it as the way to um, weed out anyone yeah. at this point. They said, if you can't, if you can't go out the door of the airplane, uh, you know, you're out. And and that and that pretty much became the way the force started to. If you couldn't do any of the the training elements, you're out. And one of the unfortunate bits was because they were on such a time frame. If you got hurt, you're out. So within the first few weeks, McQueen, Lieutenant Colonel McQueen, injures his leg during jump training. So they've lost their executive officer. Uh, there's a lot of ankle twists in, in, the, in, in, in leg, in broken legs in the, in the first couple jumps. Um, and I'll get here. Let me see. I'll bring up the some of the training here. So th this is the kind of things they were doing. Uh, they did have the, the you know, the um, – the harness is where they could practice uh, kind of controlling the chute. And they would do, you know, how you go out the door on the planes. They had some mock-ups. Uh, but pretty much, you know, this was done in 10 days. Uh, there's a stick going to the plane. They had one orientation flight. And then they'd be taken up out the door. Uh, if they wouldn't go the first time, they got everyone out that would go. They'd circle around the, again. This is your last shot. Uh, if they wouldn't put that time, they were gone. Uh, and then the next day they were up again. And after that, they'd earn their jump wings. Uh, and, and, you know, it, so this was a big part of, of being a forceman was being able to jump out of an airplane. They, they really assumed that wherever they were going to end up going, they were going to be parachuted in. Uh, so they're one of the earlier airborne formations, even in the, in the U S but when you talk to some of the veterans, you know, they, they kind of felt bad about getting the wings. They said, you know, they didn't do what, what, what they had to do in Benning, you know, the five jumps. And, but um, the, the reality is their training was so much more extensive that uh, they didn't have time for it. And they never, end up, they never will end up jumping uh, a combat jump. So, but they, you know, they, they were parachute trained. And, and that was one of the first times Frederick made a point uh, once, once they all got, got, got out the door, you know, Frederick personally went by and pinned the wings on every single forceman. Uh, and, and this is where they started to see him as, uh, well, he's one of us kind of thing. Frederick also made sure that every officer did the jumps, uh, including himself. So that's. The, well, would the it be fair to say, Brett, that, yeah, with with the regular parachute infantry units, and even the Canadian parachute battalion, that 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 they are essentially well trained infantry whose unique thing is about their delivery to the battlefield. But they go to whatever terrain they end up getting sent to. We know that you know five or third third were in Corregidor and British parachute regiment in the North Africa. It seems to me, although the Devil's Brigade, the First Special Service Force, have this parachute training, it's all much more the focus is about the speciality of how they will deal with a particular set of terrain difficulties. That seems to be right. the focus. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And, and I, I, I think, you know, I, again, the way they kind of, and this is where that special forces kind of mentality is coming in. Like, okay, we've done this. We may not have perfected it, but, but they did do some interesting things with the, it was after they were starting to get some broken legs. They ended up sending 120 some Canadians back, and, and, and uh, you know, more Americans were sent back to home units. Uh, and, and, and it's starting to raise some flags. You know, how many guys are going to get injured here? And, and they started to film the drops, and they had been doing the early, uh, you know, leg extended instead of together uh, drops. And, and, and so they adopted the, the, the British style of, of both legs together. Uh, uh, you know, when, when you hit the ground and they realized that that, that, it, it, that would instantly fix the problem. So as replacements were coming in, they were getting trained on this, on, on the new method. And then that gets sent down to Benning 
where where they changed their method as well. So the force actually had an influence on on how U.S. airborne troops would be trained from then on uh, because of what they were seeing in, in Helena, Montana. Uh, yeah, again, in the infancy, uh, they're sharing information, which which was good. Uh, and you also had some forcemen now, you know, some of the overseas forcemen had been sent to, sent to Ringway in England to do some jump training and would end up joining up with the force in, in September, the end of August, September. And some of the first one, first Camp Power guys will come up from Benning uh, after doing training down there. And, and, and Frederick still made them do their two force jumps. So some of these guys actually had extensive airborne training before getting to, to Helena. The other big component of the training early on were these route marches. You see a photo here of the forcemen. These guys would go, uh, you know, route marches, long marches. Uh, you know, they would go 20, 20 miles, then 30 miles in a day, 60 miles, uh, I think was one of the longer ones. Uh, and then they, they kind of cut it back again because they were starting to get some, some injuries. Again, the real early uh, uh, focus was the physical uh ability to, to 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 overcome any kind of circumstance to be able to carry your full weight uh you know every morning they'd get up at 4 45 they'd run up muscle mountain which was the big kind of mountain off the parade field uh you run up muscle mountain back down have breakfast and then you'd start your daily training uh mm -hmm. which could be a route march which could be whatever they were going to specialize in uh in that part of the, the training syllabus it, it was an intense routine and they weeded out people that way as well. You know, it was, it was, it was basically, you know, you go or you, or you leave, you know, you're going to, you're going to mm. be booted out. Uh, so it, it seems to me, Brett, almost like they're trying to create more like long distance. If the, if the first special service force are more like long distance athletes, whereas your parachute forces are more kind of your sprint because, you know, by, by nature of parachute doctrine, it's go in quick, secure that drop zone. Then 24 hours, 48 hours later, you're out, you'll go back right. over another jump. Whereas this seems to be more of a, no, you're going to be there and you're going to be in, in vicious terrain for some time. You need, you need that long-term stamina and ability. So, Although right. there's this connection with airborne forces and there's sort of the origins kind of tie up and there's you know, shared training, the, 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 the use of them is diverging at this point. This is where it starts to change. And you're absolutely right on the stamina. That was the, 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 the number one kind of focus here was that we could drop these guys in Norway and they're there for months. You know, they have yeah. to, you know, and, and that was that's that was really still in, in the top of Frederick's mind at this point that, you know, they're going to be dropped in in. in completely horrible winter conditions uh and, and they're there for months and, and we don't know how we're going to get them out really and they still didn't really kind of have a plan on how they're going to get them out these guys might be might be marching for 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 months on end to get to some exit point so yes stamina was absolutely the key you know and, and then after breakfast they would do an obstacle course which was from, from what i've read uh, you know, one of the one of the best in the country, incredibly intense. So the, the stamina is is the key. Um, September is also a big change month for the first. So, so so they've started. They're focusing on 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 uh, weapons. Uh, and and at first they issued the M1 carbine because they thought they were going to have to jump in and, and and operate out of this 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 vehicle. And there it is. That's the T15 Weasel. That's what eventually comes out. Uh, the problem with it was they, they still didn't know how they were going to drop it. It didn't fit any of the airplanes. Um, they had done some test parachutings of it. They're going to drop, you know, parachute it out. It, 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 it didn't work. So there was still a question of how they were going to get this vehicle in Norway. Um, but, but that's, that's what they, that's what student Baker came up with. Uh, the force will eventually end up using these things to some extent, not, not as intended. Uh, but they're getting trained on how to use these. They're getting training on, 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 um, uh, hand to hand combat, uh, German weapons, allied weapons. Uh, they're getting trained in, uh, um, they're getting night classes and, and kind of a doctrine of all of this. So September is kind of a shift month. And I'll go back to the training. So I think, I, yeah. So this is uh, a slightly later training syllabus, but the same kind of stuff. So this is some of the things that they had to, 
So this is what a replacement would be trained in to kind of get themselves up to where the force was. Um, but, you know, so we're a qualified parachutist. I haven't gotten to the skiing yet of the mountain warfare or the or, or the amphibious stuff yet. We will. Um, you know, but the the, 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 the track vehicle um, and, and the weapons. They're going to get chemical warfare, radio operator. I mean, again, they have to be completely able to contain themselves wherever they're dropped. So before I get to the scheme, things are going to take a bit of a shift in the story. Frederick goes over to London in, in uh, September of, of 42. And, and basically, you know, he wants an update on what's being planned for plow. And this is where he finds out that, uh, you know, Pretty much the Nor the, the, the Norwegians have said they don't want to be they don't they don't think it should happen. Uh, the Norwegian government in exile. Uh, he finds out that the SOE has a commando unit that that's been given the same targets uh, by 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 uh, the British government. So he's, Frederick's starting to question, well, what what are we doing? Um, he meets with uh, Mountbatten. Who, who basically at this point tells him, yeah, I think plow is, 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 is done. It, it, I, we don't think it's going to happen. And you got to remember by this point, you know, we have the invasion of North Africa has already happened. That's where the focus shift to operation torch. So September and October are, are the points where Frederick, this, this could have been the end of the first personal service force there, right there. And, uh, you know, but, but Frederick being Frederick said, well, I've got already a highly trained, specialized international force. So he immediately, when he comes back from this, oh, oh and the other, the other thing was he went to the RAF to try to get uh, support to drop the snow vehicles. And they said, well, what could your force do that we, we couldn't by bombing, you know, and, and, and he just got shot down everywhere he went. So, so when he gets back, you know, he basically goes to, to his superiors in, in Washington and says, start thinking of something you can use this for uh, and, and, and talk to the Canadian government and, and the, the Canadian government started to think about pulling the guys out, you know, maybe putting them right into one can para, but they were able to keep it going. And this is when, when Frederick decides to kind of amp up training and start to expand it. And I really equate, it's at this point where we really start to see the special forces develop because it's not just for plow anymore. He's now got to create a force that can do anything anywhere, right? So it's kind of going beyond just Norway now because he could end up going anywhere. And people are starting to th throw ideas like maybe Romania, uh, maybe maybe the Alp regions. Uh, even at one point they're talking about maybe the Pacific. Uh, you know, they, they, they knew that they had a group that was para-trained, was getting now ski training, uh, and, and uh, that – they had already started their demolitions work. Um, so you've got, you've got guys that are incredibly well-trained already. And, and, and Frederick's going to pursue this and continue with this. And he's going to, instead of, of kind of doubling or going backwards, he's going to push forward and say, okay, I need more guys. He's, a nine man section isn't right. Let's go with a 12 man section. Let's get rid of the M1 carbines. Let's go with the grand. He starts to, Focus it more toward an assault infantry mentality. That, you know, they could be shock troops. They could be, you know, they could go in. They could, they could spearhead something. They could uh, maybe go in behind enemy lines and 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 disrupt things before an invasion force comes. So he's opening up this concept of, of what they could do. So at this point, you know, the Norwegian he has Norwegian instructors there who said that the forcemen at this point. Uh, we're qualifying as experts scheming within a couple of weeks. And again, this goes back to the stamina building. Um, they would, they, they, they did extensive winter training in, in, in December and February, uh, January of, of 43, 44, where they were in, uh, uh, uh they, they're still in the, in the Montana area, but they, you know, they were out living in, in train box cars for, for a few weeks in, in, in living in, in below 30 and 40 degree temperatures. And this is where they really honed their winter skills. Uh, they could, they could operate cross country on skis. Um, 
you know, and, and I've always loved this image because it kind of sums up what they, they they started to call themselves the Paris skiers because these guys could, you know, they're, they're proficient skiers, they're airborne guys. They, 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 they're starting to get this ability. They, they kind of do a lot of things. Um, and this is probably a good time to maybe uh, talk about the, the mountain climbing. <laughs> uh, they became mountaineers in a way. They they could, they they practice daily on on. Uh, you know, using ropes and, and climbing up and rappelling down and, and, and that kind of thing, and which, you know, this will become very handy when they get to Italy uh, and, and will really mark mark what they're most famous for, uh, their, you know, their assault on the fence. Uh, but it was all done. This is all, you know, still in Montana. Uh, and, and the other thing that kind of ties into this with the, you know, Frederick was given pretty much by the war department, a blank checkbook, uh, or he could just say, look, you know, I need this. I need that. And he got priority. So at one point he wanted a jacket for the guys in training. And, and he said, I like those, I like those flight jackets. And, you know, so you have the whole first special service force wearing a two pilots flight jackets in training. Uh, and there's a photo of it. And, and, uh, I, it's always an interesting look because some of the Canadians kept their old regimental headgear and, and, and see, you have a real interesting mix. It, uh, I, can, I can see why going back to your living history days, Brett, why a unit like this is attractive because you can kind of get a, well, there's a photo of them wearing anything. I mean, who, who would have thought yeah. you could turn up at an event wearing an A2 flight jacket, a British stroke Canadian tam shanter with a Canadian cap badge, American, right. you know, American uniform items. And I mean, it's, it's a kind of, Free for all in terms of uniform, but it's a, while that photo is on screen, we had a couple of comments on the sidebar about the integration between the Canadians and Americans. I guess you're going to come up with that, but basically, the movie, which I've mentioned again, overplays that whole rivalry kind of thing and friction. I mean, you said right at the beginning the intention was to just kind of throw them all in together, and the force would be multinational, and that would be that would be it. Yep. Yeah. So, so the idea, so, so the integration was actually probably more seamless than, than you would think uh, other than, other than uh, the pay and, 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 and kind of short order drill, you know, the, the marching from here to there. Um, once the guys got to kind of work together, uh, they said within a, you know, within a few days, they stopped being Canadian. They stopped being American. They became forcemen, you know, and that was a big thing you hear. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they or they'd call themselves North Americans. They didn't, you know, uh, nationality went out pretty quick when they realized uh, how similar they were to each other. And, and of course, there were, you know, they learned quickly, like, all right, you know, don't make jokes about the, the king and, and, and uh, uh, you know, don't, don't try to involve yourself in American politics if you don't understand how we, you know. And, and once they, they kind of just had that kind of out of the way. Uh, and, and it was a lot of fun banter and, and kind of joking. It's, it's no it. different to an American unit dealing with people from the North, people from the South, East Coast, West Coast, or a British unit dealing with Scots right. and Welsh and Londoners right. and people from Yorkshire. It's a, that's how our military units traditionally come together. I mean, you, sure, you get the occasional unit well, units where they are formed from one region, so territorials or National Guardsmen or whatever. But generally right. in the military, you have people from different areas. Sure, there's a nationality difference there, but th that's that's how it is in the military. A, 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 Mar a Marine Corps unit will have people from all over the U.S. in it. That's just right. Uh, that's just how it is. You adapt. So, so you exactly. So it wasn't as big uh, a, a deal uh, to, to to the guys in the force themselves. Uh, you know, it, 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 as you said, I, I guess the, the the wildest differences would be maybe someone from Louisiana with a Southern accent versus a French Canadian, you know, who, who's, yeah. you know, so you did, but there really wasn't much, I mean, so you had some accent differences and things like that, but for the most part, they, uh, they got on, uh, incredibly well, uh, and, you know, and, and the integration was seamless really. Um, again, the Canadian government did want to make sure that, that on paper, you had a second Canadian parachute battalion to handle administrative things. But as far as, uh, you know, the discipline code and all of that pretty much went with the U S model. Uh, and, and one of the, one of the previous slides, I, 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 you know, they signed an agreement when they joined the force that they would, they would follow orders from an American officer and, and vice versa. Um, but the, really the, the integration was, was fairly seamless. And, 
you know, even, even ha- hanging out with the vets uh, in the early two uh, thousands, you know, you you couldn't tell who was Canadian or American um, unless you looked at their ribbons or you know metal bars. I mean, th- there really was was no difference between the two of them at all. So uh, he he accomplished what he set out to do and create an integrated. Uh, a completely integrated force, and, 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 and you know, it helps that, that we come from a common history and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, other than small, and, and I'll talk about this one, you know, with the insignia. You know, the one thing the Canadian military wants is Canada had to be worn on the uniform somewhere, right? But they got that with the spearhead patch that I'll, I'll show. Um, you know, the Canada was on that and on their collar, and even though they wore U.S. you know, uniforms, their, their, their dress class A uniforms. Instead of a U.S. disc, uh, it was it, they had Canada made up, uh, uh, and, and, and the officers instead of little U.S.s on the lapels, they had little Canadas made up, and and that was the only thing that really, uh, the only way you could really tell the difference between an American and a Canadian, except in these early training photos where some of them kept their old hats and, and things like that. But so yeah, early on, you know, they really could wear whatever. Um, Lieutenant Albert Lincoln Washburn, who will later be famous as, a, as an outdoor, uh, you know, uh, outdoor expert. You know, here he is training uh, forcemen on, on the use of of, of, of rucksacks and, and mountain gear. Uh, and this is this would have been an example of one of the, the, the evening lectures that they had. So they went six days a week, Monday, Monday, uh, Monday to Saturday four nights of those weeks. So they train all day and in four nights a week they, they had lectures. And this is an example of that, but showing some of the mountain equipment that they were given. And again, a blank check. I mean, they, they, you have here, you have jump boots, snow boots, uh, uh, you know, running shoes, uh, over boots, the whole, the whole gamut, um, of, of materials. They weren't lacking for supplies. And again, showing the, the, the American Canadian camaraderie early on in the, in the flight jackets. Uh, I, I will note that the officers were allowed to keep their flight jackets, but the enlisted guys had to turn them in after leaving. Oh, terrible. Yeah. So, as, so toward the end of this training, you're getting into about March. These guys, uh, and, and I do want to note that they, they, they did become demolitions experts. Uh, before you know, they, they they were pretty much given all kinds of uh, of of uh, of the most up to date uh, explosives, everything from TNT to uh, you know you know dynamite that they could throw up, but also the um, the 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 plastic kind of explosive that, that, that they could mold and and, and that kind oh, of the, thing. The LDC too, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, 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 and and uh, and paracord. Um, so they, they pretty much were told that they could go out and and you know they were they were given these targets of opportunity to go blow up mines and and bridges, and you know of course the great stories are the ones where they talk about blowing up the wrong bridge or mines and so so on the side that Frederick had a lot of uh, I guess he had a lot of fires to put out uh, literally and figuratively but uh, for the most part the townspeople fell in love, you know, and Helena fell in love with the forcemen. They, they, they pretty much adopted them before the force was to leave, uh, for William Henry, uh, they, um, you know, there was 200 some weddings. <laughs> so they married a lot of the town's girls, uh, and, and they really kind of became part of the fabric of that. Even, even to this, you know, even to this day, the force are known in, in, in Helena, Montana. So before we, move on further uh where where they go next uh just to show you the this is the actual original uh you know concept for the 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 force flash and and there it is being sewn on frederick wanted a unique look that distinguished both countries so they went with the the one shared thing we had was was the you know uh we call native americans in 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 canada the aboriginals but you know the, the 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 native uh uh spearhead uh, with with U.S. and Canada, and and he had them buy these these para whip these parachute um, aguilettes that were dyed red, white, and blue for the the, the colors of the Union Jack and the U.S. flag. Um, so this shows this is from the book, but this shows some of the unique insignia 
that was first special service force. And he had the, you know, the, the spirit, which is, by the way, the United States Special Forces still uses the, the, the spirit insignia. It comes right from the, the crossed arrows, uh, would be, uh, which came from the Indian Scouts, uh, U.S. Army Indian Scouts. Um, the uh, red, white, and blue piping for the hat. The parachute oval of red, white, and blue that was worn, uh, you know, underneath the parachute wings. Uh, and all were first issued the American wings. Canadians l later received the Canadian version of the wing. But uh, so this is some of the special. And 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 he also had a, a Pennsylvania company case came up with a knife while they were in training, uh, which would be a V forty two, very very similar to the the British commando knife that they were all you know. So, so they had a lot of specialized items just for this group. It, it distinguished them. Uh, and, and today, Special Forces still uses the crossed arrows uh, as, as a symbol. Uh, and later, the colors will, will be designed as well um, for the regiment. So, and, and I, I guess the, I should talk about the the hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I'll just say one last kind of side note on, on the training. Uh, you know, uh, Patrick O'Neill, Dermot Patrick O'Neill was was a a Shanghai police uh, officer. Third, this is your typical special forces adventure type that you yeah, think would yeah. be in this unit. They get him right. So he he's he ends up part of the. So he's Irish born. Um, he he he's he they he's in Shanghai. They end up getting him. He's in Tokyo for a bit right before the war starts, and, and, and part of the Tokyo um, British Embassy security. He sees the writing on the wall. He gets out. Next thing you know, he pops up in Canada working for the, the Canadian government. He's tied to the OSS somehow. I, I haven't really figured out totally how, you know, his full backstory. But he does end up getting recommended to Frederick by the OSS. They said, look, we've got a guy that is an expert in hand. -hand. He has come up with his own book, essentially, on how to do this. Uh, and, and he trains the force one on how to use that V-42 knife and, and, and basically – uh, he creates his kind of own martial arts and, and will stay with the force uh, and, and will kind of be Frederick's personal bodyguard uh, while, while with the force. So he's, he's an interesting character. And this is the service battalion. This is still William Henry uh, Harrison. And on their last days before they left in March, so they're going to leave in March of 44. They do a parade through the town. Uh, and this is where they end up now uh, in the in the in in on the East Coast. So they've been moved out of they, they they've done all they can do in Montana. And and Frederick wants to get the he said, all right, what are we missing here essentially? And what they're missing is amphibious training. So he sends them. They're sent to to Norfolk where where they'll, they'll learn amphibious. This is them in in. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, learning uh, basically amphib uh, operations, and, and by this point, they've been through all the winter training. I mean, they are they are at, at their physical peak, so they they really kind of blow the minds of the naval uh, amphibious trainers. You know, uh, when, when when they break the record for for going you know going down the ropes, uh, you know, going down into the landing craft, the, the, the an infantry platoon had a record at like could do it in a minute. Uh, the Marines who were supposedly the best at this, uh, amphibious landings, they could do it in about 50 some seconds the force would do it in 30, uh, 30 right. seconds. They could get a platoon into a boat. You know, for, and I, I remember I asked some of the vets about this. I said, how'd you guys do it? They basically just jumped. <laughs> they didn't even climb the ropes. Um, and, and so it, it's that kind of, this kind of shows you where they are at this point. You know, they're, they're able to, to take on tasks like amphibious landings and they'll end up using this skill. So and just before we, um, because you talked about them, them leaving Montana behind, we had a question earlier. Scott Grimwood asked about whether or not there was any co-training with the 10th mountain or, or, or their paths don't ever cross. I don't think their paths ever cross. Um, I don't really know the full history of the 10th mountain very well. Uh, but I don't. I I'm sure some of the concepts that came out of what they did in, in Helena uh, may or you know may have gotten to the tenth mountain. But you know when these guys were doing their mountain training, it, it, they they weren't meant to be mountain troops. They were meant to be 
kind of uh, everything troops, special yeah. ops guys. So I don't, I don't think that that they ever really. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure. Some, again, some liaison officers may have gone back and forth, but I don't. The force itself never really had a direct link with the temple. I mean, I would thank you. I mean, I would imagine Frederick is the kind of guy who's always submitting reports. I mean, he's obviously got connections. I mean, the fact you said when he wants stuff, he gets it. He gets the right instructors. He gets the the uniform details he wants. He gets right. the gear. He's obviously got the connections where it matters. So, so that you've got to make it a two way street. If you want stuff from the hierarchy, you've got to submit some of them. So I imagine he's sending in reports of here's the evaluation of this type of knife. Here's the evaluation of what we're we're doing with you know rope training. Here's what we're doing that. And so. I would, I maybe some of these reports ended up getting to Washington D.C. somewhere, and then someone who's setting up Tenth Mountain is get, getting access to that same kind of data. But yeah, no, no I'm direct. Sure, I'm sure connection. Right. I, I agree with you completely. I'm sure that's exactly how it went. Especially when you look at how some of the para training kind of went both ways as well. Yeah. Some of the lessons learned and how it ended up going to. Uh, Benning, uh, I am, and this I'm is yeah, sorry to interrupt you again, but this is where Frederick, you know, you, I said at the beginning, he doesn't seem like the ideal special forces person, but as you said, he adapts to it really well. But he has all that other skills that sometimes mm -hmm. some of the special forces legends weren't very good at paperwork, they weren't very good at um, keeping um, diplomatic with the powers that be, they would they were maybe a bit hot headed and too independent. Frederick seems to me to strike exactly the right balance between driving his force the direct he wants to do it but also keeping all his um his connections above and below because you know to, to progress within the military you've got to be able to you know brown knows your way up to a certain extent he seems to know how to do that he knows how to play the game he knows how to you know do the handshakes with the people that matter yeah absolutely to be a career officer in the 30s you, you kind of had to have that skill to, to make you know, it was competitive there, was, there were a lot of cutbacks in depression era u.s army you had to be, uh, you had to know how to, to kind of do it all to stay relevant. And he did. So, and I agree with you. I, I think he took, he had those skills uh, uh, and, and he's able to, to really kind of uh, push the force forward using those skills. Uh, he could be a diplomat. <laughs> he could be a politician, yeah. but he, but he wasn't, right? you know, he, but he could play the game. And that's how it, and, you know, that's how they got the Johnson light machine gun. It was, because when they were in when they were in the Chesapeake, they they, they were trading explosives for, for with the Marines, and they said, "Well, we'd love these these Johnson guns," and and it was that kind of willing and dealing, not through official channels, but you know, then the force ends up with these 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 Johnson light machine guns. They only only groups that really used them. I think they may have been using the Pacific to some extent, but yeah, Marines um, had them, didn't they? Yeah, the I mean, Marines. And, had, yeah, it was and, a Marine and some sidebar conversations about that about that weapons breakdown because. Now, again, if we're drawing parallels with commandos or parachute battalions, some units, some special force units would have a dedicated heavy weapons platoon or company. It seems that they're putting a lot of firepower within a platoon. That's going to be the way they're going to go. So you've got a, a, a 60 millimeter mortar with a platoon and uh, and the yeah. bazookas as well. So that so that that's that's interesting. Yeah, well, that's when and, and again, this is when they went from from being you know with, with the plow force wouldn't have had this this kind of break. But when he decided they're going to go assault infantry, essentially, and, and, and bolster up, you know, the 12 man sections. And he started to focus on this kind of breakdown where, where they have more heavy weapons and, and, and be more self-sufficient in, in that kind of in, in, in that kind of arena. Um, and then and then we get to, to Kiska where, where, you know, so so they've done their just to kind of so they've done their training now in 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 the Chesapeake they get moved up to uh Fort Ethan Allen in Vermont to do more training in winter kind of warfare and and and, and he's kind of at this point they're looking at honing their skills and just being uh as well rounded as possible with all of this this training they're still taking in replacements and getting up the full strength and it's about this point where they get the the orders to okay, uh, in about in, in about June of 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 forty three, they get the orders to kind of okay, uh, you guys are going to be sent to the Aleutians, uh, and 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 uh, you know, at two uh, had 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 just happened, uh, so they are they're going to be part of the amphibious task force nine. 
that is going to take the island of Kiskia. So, so finally, you know, in, in their minds, in the in the summer of forty three, they're going to be put into combat and and in, in the Pacific of all places. But this this is kind of uh, of good of kind of terrain that they're used to, uh, cold, wet, and miserable. Um, and and they're going to be sent out there. Uh, to be part of this amphibious task force. So, so they make their way to San Francisco, then they get on, on, on the Liberty ships and they head up to the, to the Aleutians. Uh, so th- this is kind of their Operation Cottage is kind of their baptism of fire without ever really being shot at because uh, the way it was broken down was 1st Regiment was going to uh, uh, land... I believe where the Canadian landing was going to take place. No, I'm sorry, where the U.S. landing was going to take place. Uh, and then 3rd Regiment was going to go in where the Canadian landing was going to take place. To the, and then 2nd Regiment was was on an airstrip ready to go in wherever needed. So you, you see the force being ready to be used. One one regiment is, is a para force. And, and the way they were going to go in was they were going to, they were going to be the assault the, the the spearhead of the assaults they were going to go in under dark by by uh inflatable boat which they had just learned those skills in in the chesapeake uh and row in and and, and take certain objectives because the main uh japanese force was in kiska harbor so they were going in the back door um and, and that's a photo of them uh, uh you know rowing in or the boats that they used when they finally got to Kiska, uh, you know, everybody knows, I, I guess, that, that the, the Japanese had withdrawn in a fog. The island had been b- blockaded by the U.S. Navy. But uh, through the heavy fogs and things there, they were able to withdraw the uh, the Japanese troops a couple weeks before the invasion. So when, when these guys landed, they landed to an empty island. But they didn't know that. And I think that's the key here. Uh, that I mean, call it the best training exercise ever or, you know, a, a disappointment. But these guys thought they were going into combat. And this really kind of was a place for them to hone all their skills uh, and, and, and kind of put what they had been trained into some kind of a practice. So this is them on Kiska. Uh you can see again. There's Frederick himself, who who was always known for going right in with the guys, and he'll maintain that reputation uh, throughout the war. And and you know he has he has the honor of being the most uh, the most purple hearts any combat general in the U.S. Army during the Second World War. So uh, he didn't shy away from being in the front. You can see an exhausted Frederick here. Uh, again, the best stuff. They're wearing the, the mountain pants, the jump boots the Arctic 41 field coats. Uh, but, you know, Kiska was miserable nonetheless. It was I, mean, I was just, just going to say, Brett, it may not have been a test of their combat ability, but it absolutely was going to test their ability to deal with cold and how waterproof their boots are and how they, because, you know, we did it. We've done a couple of shows about Atu and Kiska and, you know, forgetting, leaving aside the plans and what happened, just the terrain, the, the, the ever present fog, the damp in the air in, you know, wounds, got infected there, evacuating people out. You couldn't get a grip walking on all the terrain there. So, yeah, I'm sure Fred yeah. would have preferred some kind of combat experience to come out of it, but you couldn't have asked for a tougher environment to test the fortitude and stamina of a force. Exactly, and and that, that's what the brilliance of this this was. Uh, they really, it, it was the ultimate kind of endurance test, I guess, was was being able to you know row in on on boats. I mean, they're sucked, and and still uh, take your objectives. Uh, and yeah, the uh, the whole task force suffered casualties with trench foot and and and, and frostbite, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it was it was just miserable. Um, uh, but it was a good it was a good kind of uh, intro, and, and and they weren't there long because it was it. Uh, and this is where we'll kind of come in. Oh, there they are with a the Japanese machine gun. Uh, and that's second regiment, uh, like getting right, right before they thought they were going to jump. And this actually has an interesting, this is why second regiment is the one that goes up defensive when we get to Italy, uh, because they didn't get to do anything in Kiska because they just stood on the airstrip. So this is why they became the kind of the, the, the guys that took defensive. It's, it's your turn. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so this shows, you know, what they look like on Kiska, the second regiment and first and third regiment guys. So it's at this point, it's the quadrant conference. And here we have, uh, you know, uh, King and Roosevelt and Churchill. And, 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 and you know this from D-Day history. This is where they, they decided uh, on on uh, pretty much the Operation Overlord was going to take place. And, and, and they, they kind of agreed on, on the next course of action in, in, in uh, Italy. And so it was here. This is kind of where they made the decision that, okay, we're going to keep the force. We're going to use them. We're going to send them. We're going to send them into the Italian theater somewhere. They didn't know where, but, you know, they're going to use these guys. So they get the orders while they're sitting. You know, Frederick gets the orders while he's sitting on that beach in Kiska. You know, get the force back to the United States as soon as possible. So they bring everybody back, you know, and they get them up to Fort, uh, back up to Vermont, and then they ready them. To go into to go into Italy, uh, and, and, and again behind the scenes, it was Eisenhower that was pushing to get them over there because he, he you know, looking at the train of Italy, he said we're going to need a group like this, uh, and this is you know this is where this is where the, the kind of the fate of the first Russian service force you know this is where they, yeah. they, they they they're going to get thrown into the fray. But again, to you know, you can imagine as as much as people like guys you know frederick had an had an ambassador in eisenhower he had other people at a high level who had who yep. believed in the force you can also see from the devil to be the devil's advocate the the logic of taking these men who have, have been specialized in terrain and kind of breaking them up and say okay we're gonna go to italy maybe the winter's gonna be bad there let's take some specialists and adapt them put some in the 36th texas division put some in the you know under marks clark's army or something you could and maybe a lesser person than Frederick might have ended up seeing his force disappear because it was forces were being dis again talking about right. other special forces forces that were around in 42 43 were disbanded some some didn't survive that period right. they were morphed into other things so so a, a stre the strength of Frederick's personality and the fact that he had these people be in his camp is is why the force goes on to basically be what we'll talk about in part two. I know we've got a bit more to discuss today, but um, right. you know, the, important to understand the politics behind this is that there are moments when this force could have, could have just just stopped. Yes, yeah, and, and there were and there were and there was pressure from even the people in the Canadian government, especially as the war starts to to, to really move on. It, you know, these guys might be better as replacements than than, yeah. than putting them in the, you know. So that 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 becomes a real conversation, especially when when we start looking at the winter of forty four and, and into you know uh forty three and forty four, uh that winter, you know, you start to see some some pressure. But um yeah, I agree. Uh so but you know, at this point, and you always had I always found it interesting, Churchill, you know, he always had kind of an interest in this group as well and, and always kind of wanted to see them utilized properly uh so well they're, they're a good advert for a cooperation i mean we i mean, i'll keep absolutely. interrupting you but we will i mean i'm enjoying this you probably can tell is that we've done lots of shows where the idea of australian american cooperation british american canadian british yes. canadian american this is a good advert this is this is a good example of how different nations can work together okay it's a small force but it's a it's a good pr value as well oh absolutely Absolutely. And, and that was kind of the, that was kind of the, you know, the, that was kind of the key to this, uh, to this alliance. And, and when you think about it, and, and I'll get into this when I get into Italy as well, when, when you, when you look at what Mark Clark was dealing with, you know, Clark in, in Italy, I mean, it was a multinational force. His yeah. the fifth army was not an American army. It was commanded by an American. But you, had, you had British troops, you had, you know, you had uh, French free French. I mean, so the, the, the first was a service force kind of fits right into that kind of multinational uh, you know, force, but, but, but kind of like, as you said, the advert of this is how you do it right. You know? Yeah. This, uh, this is, is how, how you streamline. Everybody works yep. seeing to, to going to the same direction. So, um, yeah, yeah. no, it's, um, I, I, well, well, I'll let, hand it back to you because I'm, I'm just loving this. Well, I, I'm so excited so, uh, about part two is, but, but anyway, let's, let's go. This, this is where you know, we talked at the beginning about your interest and how you got involved in living history and yeah. folks. 
a little bit of this is kind of a precursor to what I'm planning for March when we are going to talk about living history reenactment. And there are people who watch my shows who don't like the idea of people dressing up as people they that you know units that they don't they weren't part of and you know why would you wear a uniform you're not entitled to all that kind of thing so this is a subject we're going to be tackling in march but from your from our point of view today folks if if brett hadn't gone down the route of becoming a living historian basically we wouldn't be having this lecture tonight i guess really yeah so yeah, it's it, you know for, for me, I mean, and, and you can make this argument, I guess, with anything. But for, living history can be certain. It's different things to different people. It's, it's if you get with the right people, do the right thing. We decided early on when we were going to do this group, <laughs> we had to tell the story correctly, uh, and, and the best way to do that was let's get in touch with the veterans. Now, granted, yeah. you, I don't know if you could. You, you know, it's harder to do that today, obviously, than it was when we when we were really kind of going and and. The, the kind of the, the kind of pinnacle of what we were trying to achieve was well let's go to a, a veterans reunion and 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 see if they'll let us set up a display and uh and and talk to them and and we did in in 2001 we went to a veterans reunion in Helena Montana uh and we show up with our our display stuff and our uniforms and uh you know the first first few hours it was kind of like well who are these guys what are they uh and by the end of the weekend we're going to the gold bar with veterans where they drank, you know, and, 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 and you know, they're, they're asking us to sit at tables with them. I'll sit with our family. I mean, uh, it, it just became, uh, you know, a really special experience. And, and, and we went with the idea that we're just going to go and be quiet and learn. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we did and became, you know, really friendly with them uh, and, and went to several reunions and set up. Uh, it was great to be able to set up like a display because that way they, they could come in and show their families what they wore and how they, you know, and so that's, you know, for us, you know, of course there's the, 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 the plain war bit to reenacting, but, but this was the most important to us being able to kind of, to interact with, with the veterans and their families and, and really learn from, from them uh, how it was done. So yeah, it, you know, that, that's, that there's a photo here, of, you know, that, that's Al Wilson, you know, he signs it. Um, Bill's story was, you know, uh, one, uh, you know, more than willing to always sit and talk with us and, and give us information and, and talk to me when I was writing the books through emails. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of their signatures and a bunch of my books. I, uh, you know, these two guys I'm <laughs> flanked by uh, Bill and, and Ray. So that was at the early reunions uh, in 2001. Sam McGee uh, was really interested in talking to us and helping us do what we did right. Uh, and then, you know, there's some photos of the displays we'd set up and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a great experience, and and, uh, and I, I still hope to get back to the, the reunions because the families still keep this tradition going, and I'd still love to go and set up at some point. But um, yeah, as far as as far as you know, wearing the uniform and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it, it's part of it's part of you know doing a living demonstration, but you know the greatest honor we got was when they gave us a plaque that said we were their official living history organization, and you know, so so there it is. Uh, it, it came from the horse's mouth, uh, and it's something that you know we were very proud of, and and uh, we can kind of tell the story not the way they could, uh, but. You know, that's that's what historians do, right? They tell the story. Yeah, so I mean, I, we're just I, I a, guess... a part of that. I guess what we're going to be talking about next week, next month, when we talk about reenactment, is at its best, it's an asset. At its at its worst, it's a detriment. I mean, it's like everything else. There are there are good books about World War Two, and there are shit books about World right. War Two. There are good movies, bad movies. There are good YouTube channels, bad YouTube channels. Everything, when done well, is an asset, and when it's done badly, it isn't. And I think. You know, we'll get into this subject in March, but you know, people have some people have just a, have decided they've got a negative attitude about reenactment, uh, and that's fine. And I'm not going to try and win those people over necessarily. And I understand why they would, because you see, the, you can see a negative side to it. Um, and I think you summed it up perfectly. When, you know, like like anything, uh, you're going to have good and bad, uh, and and you know, you just have to. If you're the learner, you you need to be able to at least figure out. Uh, you know, what bias am I looking at? Whether it's a book, whether it's you know yeah. a movie, or, or or you know, you know, if this is my source of information, how reliable is that source, right? And and yeah, you know, living history is no different. 
And, and and in the simple thing, I mean, I, you know, I've been part of being that many in my time. And I was first airborne reconnaissance squadron in the UK. Right. So when, if if you're trying to get information from a veteran, a visual stimuli, and you know, can happen. I mean, you're a teacher. If you just stood there in your classroom with no display materials, nothing to hold, nothing to look at, nothing to view, yeah. you wouldn't be doing as good job as if you can get people out into the field, give them things, give them. So the same thing with understanding history. If you can, if you can ask a veteran about so how do you get on with a johnson light machine gun he'll tell you right. something if you can give him a johnson light machine gun and say okay what were its strengths and weaknesses you're probably going to get a lot more by having that weapon in his hand and oh yeah of course it, you always used to bump you on the shoulder when you had it there we found that so at its best you learn more information so um yep. we where i mean we could probably do this in the second show but as we brought up the idea of you going you know the concept of you going to these reunions what 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 where did the veterans of this unit what do they think their legacy is do they see themselves as kind of fathers of special forces after the war or do they see themselves as a wartime unit or both wow uh well so these guys are 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 typical of when you talk to special forces guys you know you 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 always uh they 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 kind of know they're the best and when, when you've talked to and when you when you are the best at something, you don't necessarily need to be a braggart or or, or be someone that that uh, you know has to to push that. You, you kind of already are. So I think that uh, you know they're very humble, they're very modest. I think they do realize you know at, at some point uh, you know uh, at some point you know uh, the you know the U.S. Army gave them the green berets to wear. Uh, you know, you see, you see the veterans used to, you know, wore the green berets at, at, at their reunions and things like that. Uh, they, they know, they know they're, they know that kind of set the tone for, for not just U.S. special forces, but Canadian special operations forces. And, um, but you'd never hear them, but we were, the, you know, to them, they were doing their job. Uh it's, it's, my experience of any anybody whether they're airborne veterans commando veterans of anybody who is one of those specialists they they straddle that line between being supremely confident and yet humble at the same time it's yes. a very difficult line that they span but they do it really well they they right. give off an arrogance of knowing they're good but in a humble way which i realize folks sound like a paradox but brett and others watching this know exactly what i mean by that it's a yes. it's a cool confidence and yet with a humility behind it. And, and that's because they were told they were good. They believed they were the best and they still believe it. So, well, I think yeah. the best, the, the burning question is going to be about when we can arrange to have you back to do part two about, about Italy. I mean, uh, and in a sense, the, the bit where they actually uh, earn their spurs, so to speak, because as you know, it was one, one horrific battle after another. And as you right. said there, General Frederick ending up being, you know, one of the most, heavily wounded general officers of world war ii there's a lot to cover i'm glad we did split it down to two shows or maybe maybe even three i don't know but definitely <laughs> it would have been too much for, for one definitely so yes. um um but for, so yeah um we did have a question there perhaps you can send me an email and add this to the description of the on the youtube but about some reading recommendations for the for the for the force i mean obviously your book oh, i have a whole list of books point. But yeah, yeah, so I mean, I've got a couple of books some, um, uh, the, on my shelf. But you know, as we know, it takes someone who knows the subject to say, "Yeah, don't worry with that one. That one's a really good one." And you know, so if you can give us a list, I'll add it to the description uh, yeah. on YouTube. I'll give you a list of my favorites. I have, a, I have, a, I have a, 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 well, I have, I have most of the books, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll give you. you a, a, I'll, I'll give you a list of the, the, you know, probably the best ones. Okay, I'll add that to the description. Well, I think we'll end it there, really. I mean, have you, um, have you enjoyed talking to our, our merry band? It's been, it's been really great, and I think people have uh, have stuck with the training, but they are clearly looking forward to when the force gets to Italy, as am I. But as I said, it, it was important to go through this because, right. um, there, there were these situations that we've covered about the force might had to change direction it might have disappeared and and the norway's connection i think is so important right. and uh and uh, we'll cover that so i'll just remind folks that we're coming up and i'll come back and say goodbye to you so folks as i said nothing tomorrow but wednesday we're leaping in with a show about david sterling with the excellent historian gavin mortimer who i can't wait to do that and then we've got lots more shows coming up into two at the weekend about brunaval operation biting 80th anniversary of that so as usual folks 
don't forget to click subscribe. It's amazing how many of you who are watching this right now, you know who you are, who have yet to click subscribe. If you are one of those people, what's holding you back? Click the button, click subscribe, and get the notification. It helps me uh, because it helps with the algorithm. It helps you because you, you then know what I'm doing next. So please don't forget to do that and consider becoming a YouTube member or a patron. Both of those things would be very, very much appreciated by me. Again, links to the books in the description below. Uh, but right now, I'm going to say thank you very much, Brett, for joining us. And um, we will get our heads together about when we can do part two. It won't be for the, 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 a few weeks because I've, I've got a busy schedule, but maybe May, maybe late April. I don't know. We'll do something. We can figure something out. This has been great. I really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Okay, then. Well, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I'll see you all again on Wednesday. Enjoy your day off. And perhaps you can go and watch a bit of Brad's on this day in Canadian Military History Channel when you're having a break from me or go and watch a fighting and listen to a fighting on film podcast, something like that. But anyway, I will see you again Wednesday. Cheers, everybody. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Bye.